Welcome to Gospel Bound, a podcast from the Gospel Coalition for those searching for resolute hope in an anxious age. I'm your host, Colin Hansen, and each week I'm joined by insightful guests to talk about their written work and how the gospel applies to all of life. Together, we keep looking until we see God working. Wherever you're listening, welcome. I'm glad you're here for today's conversation. Pandemic, cultural change, political polarization, technological disruption. Well, no wonder I always open this gospel-bound podcast about searching for resolute hope in an anxious age. And all that was true even before Russia invaded Ukraine. Mark Sayers doesn't mince words about these challenges in his new book, A Non-Anxious Presence, How a Changing and Complex World Will Create a Remnant of Renewed Christian Leaders, published by Moody. But he sees them as a prelude to revival. He writes, We feel the gap between the vision of the church we encounter in Scripture and the reality on the ground. This gives rise to a deep desire for God's church to be refreshed, empowered, and renewed. Revival is no quick fix, however. It's not a way to avoid hardship and effort. Spiritually renewed leaders need stamina, pain tolerance, and emotional discipline. Early success is one of the worst things that can happen to them. Leaders in an ever-changing, anxious environment must learn to rely on God and not on their own abilities. No one alone is sufficient to the task of Christian leadership in an Internet age when we're everywhere and nowhere at once. This is our reality, whether we like it or not. Sayers writes this, In the networked world, even the most committed believer will consume only a fraction of the information and input from their church compared to what they consume via podcasts, YouTube, and Netflix. The digital network is now our primary formational environment. It shapes our opinions, values, and worldview. Today, the average churchgoer will Google a problem before they approach their pastor. The digital network is the primary shaper of their theological, political, and cultural worldview. The congregation may be physically present within their church, but their primary influence comes from the digital networks to which they are connected." End quote. Well, Sayers serves as senior leader of Red Church in Melbourne, Australia, and he's my first repeat guest on Gospel Bound as he was featured in episode three. I look forward to talking with him again about tribalism, anxious systems, maturity, hardship, and more. Mark, thanks for coming back on Gospel Bound. Oh, absolute pleasure. Let's just start with some basics here, Mark. I don't expect everybody would be familiar with the concepts that you're introducing uh, to a lot of us in this book. So just start by explaining what is non-anxious presence. Yeah, non-anxious presence is a, a term that came from Edwin Friedman, who he started as a rabbi, um, but he's also a family therapist and sort of Bowen family systems therapy. And, uh, you know, he came up with this idea that actually um, – human systems so relational networks um, that anxiety can move through them say the way a virus moves through a population um, we're all now pretty um au fait with you know pandemics and infectiousness and all that sort of stuff and you know his sort of argument was that actually the same thing happens when humans get fearful it can go through a crowd i don't know if, you know I've, I've been in a crowd once when um you know there was like fear going through it and it was quite amazing to see how people change very quickly and act very non-rationally um, that can happen if there's a fire in a movie theater. That can happen when there's a natural disaster. But also it can just happen at this sort of much more lower level in a church, you know. And, you know, Friedman talked about triangulation, you know, like a new pastor comes into a church and they're a little bit unsure and, you know, conversations begin when someone says, oh, you know, what do you think of this guy? I don't know. What do you think? Oh, did he say that? And it's almost like it grows like a mold <laughs> and um, can spread really quickly. And uh, Friedman's sort of answer to this sort of fear and, and anxiety that moves through through people and human systems is um, to be a leader with a very kind of different posture that often is argued that leaders need. Often uh, leaders are described because of a physical capability. They're very tall or they have a commanding voice or they're striking or charismatic. You know, Friedman actually argued that, you know, much of our leadership comes from us being non-anxious when everyone else is anxious. Um, one example I give in the book is, you know, just say you go and, yeah, you know, you're hearing it, something at the local town hall and all the, say, the mayors and the city leaders are, are giving the talks at the front of the room. And then just say someone screams, fire. And all of a sudden, the mayors and the leaders at the front of the room are all sort of crying and huddling and shaking in corners. But then someone at the back says, 
okay, everyone, this is, we're, you know, we're prepared for this. That's the exit. Everyone just quietly head towards that door. We're going to get through this. That person up the back at the beginning of that meeting may have had no leadership gravitas, but in that moment, because they're the most calm and clear, they, in a sense, then become the leader. So it's a really helpful way, I think, particularly always in any human sort of uh, relational network. But I think at this time, you know, when anxiety is everywhere and often amplified because of our social networks now a part of a digital network, I think it's a really helpful tool. When did you first encounter Friedman's work or when and how did you first encounter it? Yeah, so my, my mentor, Terry Walling, um, who's part of Leadership Breakthrough, he, he just uh, mentioned the book and um, said I should read it and read it and, yeah, found it really, really interesting. Yeah, it, it's uh, – he he wrote it before he died. Uh, sorry, he wrote it as at the end of his life. He died actually as, and so it's sort of a compilation of his friends and family pulling together the book. It's interesting. One of the reasons why I was so interested in doing this interview with you is because I began to see a lot about and from, or a lot about Friedman from Christian leaders across a theological spectrum. I have a feeling it has to do a lot with the last couple years, which. Oddly enough, you and I would have talked before the pandemic last time. It's amazing to think of what's transpired in those two years. I think you've alluded to this, but why don't you go a little bit deeper on this? Why do you emphasize anxiety as a systemic issue? I think we've, we've thought about anxiety under the guise of mental health, and it is. Um, but often, I think how mental health has been treated in the West is it's seen, because we're individualistic, it's seen as uh, individualistic ailment. Um, in a sense, what our society says is, oh, I'm, you know, if you feel like you're not functioning, if you feel like something's wrong, you know, often, um, you know, that will be said, oh, you're feeling anxious about that. And so it's like often, uh, you know, I think there's a genuine anxiety disorder diagnosis out there. But I feel that actually what's happening in our society is that we're using this term anxiety of a way of saying, oh, that's because all these people are anxious. We don't then say, well, hang on, is there something happening in the culture and society which is making us anxious? Jean Twenge in her book uh, looks at iPhones, you know, and the charts she's got in the book, when iPhones come in, the anxiety of young people just, just absolutely skyrockets. So there's clear social and cultural elements to anxiety. You know, that's why I found, you know, so for example, at the moment, you know, just before we go on, on air here, we were talking about, you know, the war in Russia, you, you, or Russia and Ukraine. You read it. It is a perfectly human response to read about the potential of escalatory nuclear strikes and feel anxious. That's actually your your body doing the right thing, a fight or flight mechanism. Um, but I think we've there's also an ideology attached to anxiety sometimes that you should be feeling good all the time, you know, without any connection to any greater meaning. So I think that that it's been a way that our society's used to talk about a reaction that's happening in people that's genuine and needs to be addressed because it's speaking of something bigger going wrong in the culture. Yeah, it's helpful, Mark. Um, explain a gray zone and how you describe that in this book. What I'm arguing in the book is that we're actually entering into a, into not a necessarily a new era. Like, I mean, I love eras. <laughs> you know, you read about this particular era, the Renaissance or, you know, the Reformation, church history or whatever, and you go, okay, cool. I can, I've got a container in my head to work out what the feel and, and, and values and, and heroes and villains of that era was. And what I realized is it doesn't feel like that now. Like it's really hard and to understand what exactly what is this era. It's very confusing. It's disorientating. All the words that people use. So, you know, I began to think that actually that eras don't just begin and end. The Renaissance didn't end on a Tuesday and, you know, the next era began on a Monday or, you know, like uh, whatever. You know, like there's actually these in-between bits that are sort of like portals or, or you know, corridors in between eras. And often they overlap. And I had a chance in this book to write about a movie as an example of a, of a gray zone, which is the, the Orson Welles movie, The Third Man. Now, when I was a kid, I, I grew up watching in Australia, you often have on Saturdays, uh, lots of old World War II movies, black and white ones, and, you know, movies like The Battle of the Bulge and all this. And, and growing up as a kid, it was really clear who the bad guys were, who the good guys were. You know, often it was the Brits or the Americans were the good guys and the bad guys were the guys in, you know, the German uniforms. The gray, uh, sorry, the um, third man, the first time I, I saw it uh, when I was young and I was like, I don't get this. Like, it's confusing. It's after the war. It's in Austria. And there's a scene in the very end where the villain, uh, Harry Lyme, played by Orson Welles, is being chased in the underground of um, Vienna. 
but the actual guys chasing him are the, the, the Austrian army. And so they're wearing German uniforms and the German hats and you want them to catch the bad guy. And as a kid, I found that so disorientating because like everything in me had said, no, they're bad. But the movie's this weird in-between space. The Cold War hasn't begun. World War II hasn't, so is ended, but not really. And that's my argument. We're in this era where elements of the old era are still present. We see little bits of the new era beginning. And we're in this transitory in-between space. And I think that's worth recognizing because you have to understand that in gray zones, and gray zones is, a, is, I mean, this is even more relevant now. Uh, I, I took that from studies around asymmetric warfare, dirty wars. There was an article, I think it was written by Mark Galliotti in Foreign Policy, I read about six years ago, where they talked about sort of gray zone warfare, where it's like, it's not full on warfare, it's cyber warfare, it's information warfare. The incursion into Crimea in 2014 was an example of this. Like, everyone's like, are we at war? I don't know. There's guys without markings on their uniforms are now around government buildings in Crimea. What, what is this? So that concept I've taken from war and now sort of put it over culture. I tell people often, Mark, that we are in the early stages of an information revolution on the same level as the printing press. And a lot of the times these things are only obvious to our great, 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 great grandchildren, the historians who are writing about it. Um, history doesn't tend to work in clear eras. They do tend to overlap. It doesn't usually work with a decade, the 50s versus the 60s versus the 70s. Just it doesn't change, doesn't come in that in those ways um, that, that we might um, often want to describe. And so it seems, if, I'm under, if, if I might... Uh, might suggest this, it seems that more than anything else, it's the internet that has introduced this gray zone, where there's enough of the pre-internet world still with us. Many people like me and you who didn't grow up necessarily our whole lives with the internet, and so, which is different from younger generations. And so you still have that. So I don't think we've seen the full effects in the pandemic itself has contributed to dramatic change in people's approaches uh, toward the internet. I guess in this gray zone of the internet, how do you navigate the trade-offs of the internet as a unique opportunity to share the gospel? To be able to do things like this interview from Birmingham, Alabama to Melbourne, Australia, and at the same time, it is this anxiety super spreader. How do you balance those trade-offs? Yeah, it's it's... It's, it's part of a bigger dynamic that's happening in the world is what I began to realize that a lot of what is happening with the internet is this process of decentralization and there's good elements to that and there's bad elements to that. Let's, again, you mentioned, you know, the printing press and the Reformation. Um, the Reformation, you know, is deeply linked to that information revolution that happened at that time. The printing press enabled the Bible to get into the hands of so many people. And so many people encounter the, the, the scriptures and the good news of Jesus in this new way. At the same time, it also was filled with occult tracts and political pamphlets, which caused war across Europe. And so it was a time of renewal, but also revolution. I don't think there's a technique in the midst of that. I actually think that it comes from a closeness to Jesus and a continual viewing this all through a biblical worldview. And, you know, where you're constantly holding everything. I think, I think you know, if, if you look at how did people in that time, you know, what cut through and, and brought the sort of renewal to the church during the Reformation was actually the Bible <laughs> and, and, you know, an engagement with Scripture. And, um, you know, I feel at this time, um, you know, we need that cultural discernment, but we also need the biblical framework and the biblical worldview. And I feel like what's also happening is as power drains away from, all the authorities and institutions of culture, like it's almost culture-wide. That's frightening for a lot of people. And it also makes us examine our idols of what we've put in our hope in outside of Jesus. So I think my answer to that is not necessarily even methodological, it's, it's theological that, you know, I see this as an opportunity, this moment of disorientation as to push deeper. And, and yes, you're getting people who are going down the rabbit hole with YouTube videos who've deconstructed their faith or gotten into conspiracy theories or whatever. But I also know people who have grown in their faith through choosing the right resources. And I think that's probably very similar to what's happened. Um, as you said, we can talk like this. Like I can access 
so many of the best theologians and teachers in the world in ways I couldn't before the incident. And so, you know, I think that that is creates a, a remnant in the midst of all this. Yeah, and if we could go back and get rid of it, we wouldn't. I mean, that, that's just the fact of how we live forward is we take for granted the the benefits and we sort of fixate on the problems of some of those new technologies. I mean, I would not go back to a time when I couldn't have a conversation with you and when I couldn't learn from you, but all these different ways. And yet I recognize the real dangers for my, for my kids uh, with that. And so it just seems that that's part of the challenge of navigating anything in our culture, and maybe especially at a time when, when generations are being so disconnected from each other. And uh, one of the things that I, I see in this gray zone as well, that's pretty confusing, and you describe it in the book, you, you, you talk about how the left, sort of political left, wants collectivism and community spirit, and the right wants traditional values of faith, family, and national service. So if that's true, why do we just get a lot more loosely connected individuals <laughs> yeah, as a result yeah, yeah. of that? Well, I think, I think I think one thing that the church has rightly looked at at times, and particularly in, in apologetics and people looking at worldviews, is the power of ideas. And ideas absolutely matter. But also the structure of society also mediates how we then act. Um, you know, you can have someone who, you know, or believes in, in, you know, an equitable distribution of wealth and that people, there shouldn't be economic inequality, but then themselves lives in this particular way, which is the opposite of that. And I think, you know, that principle is what's happening in society, that what I find so fascinating is the move towards atomization happening in the world that is on both the left and the right. Um, you know, there was times on, say, the left, the early nascent left, where people were getting into utopian communities and there were socialist, you know, utopian communities. I think it was, you know, it was Owen, you know, who was trying to build these things in sort of early British socialism. Yet you don't see that as a widespread movement today. That actually really what I think the underlying structure of the society of the world, um, you know, particularly, you know, you look at, you know, probably from the 1980s onwards and, you know, neoliberalism economically, the digital um, um, decentralization. So what's actually happening is the movement of culture, regardless of our ideas, is moving us towards, uh, you know, in this decentralized moment, is moving us towards increased atomization. You know, often I've said before that if you, know, if you took the interns, say, from MSNBC and Fox News, and you actually looked at, okay, how do they spend their time? Okay, they might have different things that clothes they might wear or different bumper stickers. But I actually think if you actually looked at their lifestyles, how they spent their money, their their relational, sexual lives, it would not be that different. And so, you know, that's what I'm trying to say. There's something bigger going on than just underneath this polarization. There's a, there's much bigger sort of geopolitical structural issues happening. Well, I couldn't agree more, Mark, which is why I've had you back on the podcast and why I learned so much from you is because it seems as though the the things that we imagine are the cultural changes are on the surface. There are much bigger, the things that we share in common, right or left, United States and Australia are actually much bigger and more important. But it seems like a lot of church leaders don't talk about those changes that we take for granted, the ones that we're all a part of. And so I think about in this transitional period, where there's overlapping concepts, you you write this, we want the freedom and autonomy of radical individualism while being dependent on the opinions and emotional climate of the crowd. It's not consistent. It does not make a lot of sense. But that's, that's what it is. That's how it's working out. You mentioned atomization. I was going to jump there next, but I wanted you to connect it to how Okay, we can all acknowledge, yes, we atomized, decentralized, deinstitutionalized, and yet what it's led to is tribalization. Explain how atomization leads to tribalization. Amy Chua wrote a book called Tribes, and she has a fantastic illustration um, at the beginning, which is you know, the United States and um, its allies, including my country, went to Iraq to build this sort of new democracy. And... Uh, what they didn't realize is the incredible, intricate tribal structure of Iraq. Uh, I remember, um, uh, probably Americans didn't notice it at the beginning. I remember because Australia played Iraq. In, I think it was the, I think maybe the 2006 Asian football championships because Australia got beat by Iraq. I remember that. But Iraq won. And it was this big herald of this moment. Like Iraq, 
is this country which has gone through the war and here they win the Asian, the Asian football champions. Something fascinating happened when they handed the trophy across, which was they handed it and then there was sort of this fight, uh, you know, not a major fight, but they were all arguing with each other because, you know, there were Turkmen there, there were Shia, Sunni, um, and there was all these different tribal and ethnic groups. And so, you know, what Amy Chua says is, you know, America went to the war and realized that they, they were being thwarted in building a democracy because of the tribal nature of Iraq, but then came back to their own country and realized that America is just as tribal. And I think this has been something that the West has missed, that there's something innate in humans that looks for meaning and looks for group identity. And there is a deeply tribal element within culture. Um, I think, you know, the conversations around race, you know, sees part of that in that, but it's bigger than race. It's class, it's, it's region, it's, it's ethnicity, it's, it's thought patterns. Um, humans are deeply tribal. And I think that, you know, like, you know, Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find home in God. There is something wide in us to find a bigger meaning. And I think that tribalization is something the West doesn't want to talk about because so much of the project of modernity was undoing tribalization. But again, you know, we, we talked about it. We, we're here as uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine. And part of the reason I think so many analysts were like, he's not going to do it is because we did not understand what the, the lure of that tribal dynamic of, of, you know, blood and soil. You know, we thought we'd gotten past that, but Europe's back here, you know, and you're seeing now sort of liberal democratic Europe all of a sudden having to go, hang on, are we a tribe <laughs> in contrast to them? And um, so, you know, I think that's a key thing that we've missed out. I think that you must get to this point where atomization eventually turns into tribalization. I think it's part of this gray zone moment where, you know, the previous era was marked by atomization, but people who are atomized you know, turn into, uh, I think, increasingly tribalized. They go back to old patterns from the past. You're seeing that, you know, with, with Putin trying to resurrect Rus, you know, this great Russian uh, homeland. But then you're seeing people create on the internet new kinds of, you know, these things like furries now, you know, like like there's these subcultures that are unthinkable. Humans are built, for, or not, you know, like humans uh, you know, are built for a relationship and, and that can return tribal very quickly. Mark, in, in my last few questions, a lot of this is going to be connected, especially to Friedman um, and, and why Friedman's work has been so helpful for me personally as a Christian in my, my personal life, in my work as well. And I think it's very applicable to church leaders after what they've been through. And I think no doubt that's a lot of your motivation in this book. Describe the shift in leadership from building consensus to desperately avoiding conflict. Well, I think if, if, if you think about the sort of post-war world that grew up, it was, it was a culture where America was the great superpower in the world. There was ideologically a moment of unity. If you think about what media looked like in a lot of the you know, second half of the 20th century, it was mass media, radio, Hollywood, TV, only a, a small group of um, network channels, some big newspapers, you know. And so, in a sense, you could, you could, you know, powers that be could could basically put forward a message and then try and gain consensus. And very much written into that was the idea of, you know, the public that out there there is this public, and they all think one thing, like a sort of monolithic creature. And we brought that into the church. So the idea was there was also a greater language of compromise and negotiations. The political processes were still there, and those political processes were also built on courtesies. And there were sort of structures to how you spoke to people and what you spoke about and so on. And a lot of that was in reaction to how badly politics went early. I mean, there's stories even you're dueling, you know, there's, there's stories in US politics of you know, people pulling out guns and having duels at dawn and all this sort of stuff. So they created this, this architecture. How do, you, how do you talk? How do you have disagreement? But then also this time of, of very much sort of mass opinion. So we brought that into the church. And the idea was, you know, you can have a vision, you sort of communicate it to the mass. And everyone agrees with that. And then, you know, you move towards your goal. We're now in a retribalized. So if, in a sense, that was, that was how you do consensus in a single tribe. <laughs> but now the decentralization, that, that's a unified authority which is respected and communicates downwards. Now in a decentralized moment of technology distributing power, uh, there's all this power in the church. And all of a sudden, the pastor becomes like a referee trying to like hold together all these disparate groups who are being formed not by the social relational network of that church, but actually all these disparate groups that they're part of, which could be political, which could be you know ethnic, which could be social, 
And that means that pastors find themselves in the midst of, of, a, of a battle. So they're almost mediating a battle. But then also what happens is the anxiousness turns on them and they find themselves almost in, you know, the sort of um, sacrificial lambs, if you like, for this anxious war. Yeah, I don't know if, Mark, I somehow learned all these things from you and it just passed into my system, or if you and I have just been teaching the exact same things unknowingly for the last couple years, because these are all the messages that I've been trying uh, to convey to, to pastors who, uh, the way I describe it is that if it's happening to you and you alone, this leadership transition, then maybe you should look in the mirror. If it's only happening to everybody in your country or in your theological tradition, Maybe you guys should have a talk about about that. If it's happening to everybody, it's a revolution. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing right here for the reasons that you're discussing. Now, Mark, not that I would have any experience with this, but should institutions be less worried about negative feedback? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what, what happened as well, in, in it, it got so good in that unified moment that when you've got command of control of the means of communication, you can massage your message very well. And at that height of mass media, one of the concerns that they had was, hang on, we're just talking at people. What if we're actually not listening to them? So they created things like focus groups, polling, all this sort of stuff. Actually, the origins of polling is fascinating because a lot of it actually went back to sort of intelligence and you know, trying to work out what publics thought to sort of stop revolutions. And I think like George Gallup may have been an intelligence officer, you know, and it, like so a lot of these guys, you know, early on. Joseph, so Joseph of- Garibalds, Joseph Garibalds was a great, was a huge pollster. And that was oh, really, wow. I mean, even in a, even in a totalitarian regime, he was constantly polling the German people about yes. their attitudes, about what was happening. I read about that in a book called uh, a German War. So Garibalds was absolutely like cutting edge when it came to those social sciences of, of propaganda. Obviously, an extremely wow. negative example, but you can mm. see that as well before Gallup even. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Um, so like there's a sense where we then became finely attuned to any negative feedback, you know, and you think of how, you know, if you were really annoyed at your brand of toothpaste, like you'd have to send them a letter, you know, like it was very rare that anyone would bother to do that. You had the people who wrote into the local newspaper to complain about things. And often they were the same people, <laughs> you know, they're like, Oh, here he goes, you know, he's, he's so-and-so from that place, you know, just write another letter. But then what happens with social media, it gives us this instant feedback loop and a very powerful feedback loop. That's not just, like vertical, which can speak truth back to power, but also can operate horizontally as well and create very quickly a sort of movement really quickly at high impact, the power of the hashtag. And so we've, in you know, a lot of people have come out of seminary, just even come out of leadership in the business world going, oh, we need to hear what people are saying. We've got to respond to that. But very quickly, it's almost like a guerrilla force has got more powerful weapons And, you know, like you look at, you know, I mean, it's a crazy analogy, but, you know, you look at when, you know, in Afghanistan during the Soviet war, they got stinger missiles, you know, it was like this game changer because all of a sudden it's a couple of guys on horses could shoot down a Russian, you know, helicopter. And it's almost like the internet's given this sort of like very powerful weapon. And so there's a power shift. I don't think people realize this. There's a power shift from, from the sort of authority to the public. Does authority still have power? Absolutely. Of course, there's still institutional power, still a thing. But increasingly, the public is empowered. And this time, this is where it's really confusing because there's incredible stories where genuine injustices in an institution have been confronted by this. And it's and it's a good and holy thing. And it's wonderful. So you can have one church where you've had a, a, a toxic leader, you know, you can have had financial mismanagement or just, you know, power abuse. And the people have said, nah, and, and it's been called out and it's been a healing thing. Literally, the next church down the road you can have a leader who's actually trying to do the right thing who's being undermined uh, by different groups. This is where it's confusing. Um, it's, it's very, it needs a lot of nuance. Um, so negative, you're going to get, like straight up, you're going to get negative feedback. Like, like it's going to happen <laughs> in this world. Someone will find something wrong with something you're saying, even if it's the most respectful comment, you know. And so I think that, you know, it's interesting Increasingly, are seeing like the Biden campaign said this. You're hearing this in other places. They're saying our new way of winning office is to not listen to Twitter. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm here. You're hearing that across the political spectrum. You're hearing that in our election. So I think that we need to, yeah, 
not mistake that feedback, but just realize that if you're going to go in a particular direction, you're going to get pushback. Um, so it's not winning everyone over. It's going to where God wants you to go. Yeah, which which gets back to the non-anxious presence. Uh, one thing to add on social media is that, for example, especially on Twitter, but this is true of other platforms as well, you can't punch down. You can only punch up. And so as an institution or as a, as a, as a leader, you can only lose influence there. It shows you that dynamic. It doesn't work. Somebody can say whatever they want about you as long as they are posturing themselves as the outsider. As long as they're postured as the outsider, they're not bound by any of those rules of conduct. But then it's not a fair fight because the institution or the mainstream leader has to fight by different rules. And they can't win. The game is entirely rigged against them. And like you said, there's a really good dynamic to some of this because it's taken down a lot of people who deserve to be taken down, (laughs) who would not have been taken down in previous generations. But you're exactly right. The nuance is that it doesn't discriminate between the good leaders and the bad leaders. It's everybody, one way or another. So really, the only thing you can do is orient yourself toward Christ and what he's called you to do and live with integrity and and holiness. You don't really have any other options. Now, I've got uh, got a quote here I want to read. It's a little bit longer, and uh, it's 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 clear of of Freedom Friedman's influence on you in this quote. But you you write this with the system rearranging itself to cater to the most emotionally unhealthy. Those who wish to reflect, gain some distance to find perspective, or practice emotional health will pose a threat. For example, a leader who decides to confront the issue of toxic political polarization within those they lead will often find others cautioning against such a remedy, instead of recommending that leaders avoid upsetting either side, end quote. Now, Mark, we could do a whole episode just on this concept. You continue with this, quote, In this scenario, appeals to unity and inclusivity are masquerades to resist growth and any attempts at emotional renewal. Eventually, the herd instinct, rooted in emotional toxicity, will lead to fragmentation and falling out as dysfunctional members of the system turn on each other, end quote. Now, Mark, the application for church leaders should be obvious, but uh, tell us more. Yeah, part of a, a, a deep personal thing, and I think particularly this is, and I'm not exactly sure in the U.S. if this is exactly the same as here, but particularly for a lot of millennial leaders I know growing up at our version of elementary school, there's so much teaching now about how do we all get along? How do we agree? And, you know, I see a lot of millennial leaders where it's, it's, they find it really difficult to go against their peers. They're almost more willing to let down an authority leader or someone from a different, um, you know, uh, age cohort, but it's just really hard to go against your peers and this sense that we can all agree and, and get along. And again, I, I, my sort of argument is, that's actually very ideologically tied to that mass idea of culture where there's one set of rules and there's an authority leader who's going to, you know, make sure that is, is ratified. <laughs> so the teacher will be the one who likes, let's all get along, but the teacher's actually there going, oh, you agree with that person and so on. And so conflict, I think we've seen as something that's absolutely wrong. Like the good place is where everyone's smiling and everyone's happy. But I just don't think that accords with human reality. That looks good in stock photography in some advertisement, but it doesn't actually happen in life. And I think any anything in history, any endeavor, any political endeavor, any creative endeavor, there are people who are going to disagree. And I think we have not equipped people to to do that. You know, and I know churches that have gone on mediation processes with disputes that have literally lasted a decade. Like it's insane. And and the the message of Jesus is, you know, that, that, that then plays second fiddle to work, you know, this, this all out. And so, you know, I, I think that partially we've, we've poorly prepared a lot of pastors for the reality of what it actually is to, to lead at this point in time. And because of this anxious environment, because we want to include everyone, which is incredibly noble, but there's something different. Like, I think, I think we've got to have, I feel like there's these, these words we throw, like inclusivity or whatever, that are really important, but they need extra definition. And we can just throw them out. And you think what I think what you're saying is this, and you think what I'm saying is this. So, for example, you know, you look Europe all of a sudden 
again, to use the live Russia example, is all of a sudden now having to define its values, having to define what it actually sees as its exclusive values, um, having to define what its borders are around what it believes, how, what is it going to do to protect those values? Um, and you're seeing this in, in the space of a few days. It's, it's actually quite amazing. You know, the speeches given by Chancellor Olaf Schultz and, and uh, Emmanuel Macron, it sounds like completely different people because all of a sudden there's a challenge and there's a conflict. So, you know, inclusivity is very different of, you know, we need to, we have not included people who are from these ethnic group backgrounds or racial backgrounds or economic backgrounds or we've marginalised that voice. That's very different to include that person over there who actually may have nefarious or deeply dysfunctional tendencies. But I think we've had this far too undefined sense of these, these values and they need greater definition. Um, again, on one sense, a, a, a desire to be inclusive will, in, you know, create a church which looks more like, you know, what we see, you know, in you know the city of Jerusalem, you know, and the people of God of diversity. But then the, there's this other extreme where I, I don't think it includes people who are acting through narcissism and, and toxicity to actually bring systems down. And those people exist. Like I think part of the myth of the West, which we're in shock now, Vladimir Putin, is genuine evil exists. <laughs> People who don't care and are willing to blow up the system exist. So how do we protect ourselves from them? And so in a sense, just, just to add one interesting thing. So NPR put up a tweet, I think day one of the conflict, and it was basically like very much like this. Like, you know, if you're watching, you know, we're all very tired and our mental health has been tested in the last couple of years. I'm paraphrasing poorly here. You know, and if you're seeing lots of this Ukraine conflict imagery, prioritize your mental health, step away from Twitter, you know, to recover. And it was, you know, that's very much the tone of what you've just mentioned, but it was utterly destroyed. There were literally like war correspondents and Ukrainians writing back like, are you kidding me? You know, we're in a bomb shelter and, you know, I'm afraid my kids are going to die and you privileged, you know, rich people in the West think that you need to prioritize your mental health. So I actually wonder whether that's going to start to be deconstructed in our culture because I think the tenability of, in the culture that we're going, it's hard to keep this, this place of that. Well, I think this I think this is connected. You can see Friedman's influence again on this this quote from you in the book. You write leaders who wish to be a non-anxious presence must keep their nerve and push through the backlash, sabotage, betrayal from friends and colleagues, criticism and emotional pain and keep growing toward the higher vision in a non-anxious way. It's a bit of a softball here, Mark, because your book <laughs> is so it is so set up to be able to help help Christian leaders to experience spiritual renewal. So my question is, how do you hold up? Because that sounds rough. I don't think many millennial pastors sign up or, or younger pastors, people called into ministry or any kind of leadership are thinking that's what their life is going to be like. But it's interesting what you said about younger generations and how they're ill-equipped for this challenge. It's pretty interesting Somebody that would agree with you is the famous American football coach, Nick Saban, who talked about this exact thing. He said, you can't get people to step up as leaders because they're unwilling for anybody to not like them. Well, that's, that's, a, that's part of the very definition of leadership is being willing to do things that are going to make some people, especially anxious people, trying to sabotage the system for themselves. So again, how do you, how do you hold up? How are you able to withstand that? I was at something recently and there was a leader, I won't name them, who I really, uh, my wife and I really admire and I think it's an incredible leader, has shown a non-anxious presence, um, such a godly leader. And there was a moment that was sort of like, it was like a talking to this person and their wife and, and there was a bit where, you know, they asked um, this person's wife, you know, what the journey's been like and... You could just see that little moment. They held it together. But you could just see that crack in her voice and then just a change in his persona, which is normally an anxious where you thought, man, there is this, they've taken hits, you know. And, you know, I think about my life and I feel the same. You know, all of that I just said in many ways is true of my life. And I think any leader who has been in ministry for some time, they, they experience that. And I think partially in a consumer sort of society, in a hedonistic society, the thing we're told is if you do this, you're going to have this payoff. You know, you, this person moved job to have this more meaning and fulfillment job, you know, fulfilled job. What they don't tell you is what it costs. But, you know, I, I realized is Jesus told me what it would cost. You know, Jesus said, take up the cross and follow me. And um, 
you know, I, I read, I, I love, I think one of the most resetting and refreshing things to do is read biographies of great Christian leaders and all of them, all of them. I have yet to read the great Christian leader who's like, you know, here is Fred Smith and he did great things for God and his life was pretty boring and he just had a great house and everything was wonderful and went to nice parties and everyone thought it was brilliant. Like everything was, every single, I'm, I'm yet to read the one where it's not unbelievably tough for these people. Um, but that's the path that Jesus Jesus led. You know, Jesus, you know, we're in, we're in, you know, leading up to Lent, leading up to Easter period now. And, and that's the path that Jesus walked towards the cross. We don't have to do his work on the cross. It's been done for us, but we're called to walk in his footsteps and take up our, our cross. And, you know, that that's what keeps me going at the end of the day. Like, I'm not doing this to feel self-fulfillment. Do I feel meaning at times? Absolutely. I feel incredible meaning. I remember being at a party, a bunch of people who weren't believers and, and they all went around saying how their jobs didn't give them meaning. My job is so hard at times. I've come so close to quitting at times, but there's nothing I have more meaning than being in the will of God. And I think we need to explain that that message to people. Um, and particularly, again, going back for millennials, one of the hardest things you're going to have to sacrifice is the approval of your peers and even the friendship of your peers. Including, including in the church. It's pretty tacky, yes. Mark, for the interview for the host to um, promote his own book <laughs> in an interview, but I actually did a book called 12 Faithful Men. I edited it, and the entire purpose of that book was because of what you said right there, which was that you have younger leaders thinking something's gone wrong, people don't like me, because they've been trained thinking you're called into ministry because people like you when you talk about Jesus. And so they're completely thrown off in ministry when it doesn't materialize. And many of them quit because they think something must have gone wrong. I must not have discerned the call correctly. So my message has been to go back to the Bible, look at every leader in the Bible, of course Jesus as the quintessential example there, and I said, you probably had some hero in history who helped to lead you, you know, reading biographies that, that helped lead you into ministry. What's common with all of them? They were unpopular. Every single person. Now they weren't necessarily unpopular with everybody. Then they probably wouldn't be a leader, but they were deeply unpopular. They suffered tremendously. Every single one of them. That's the norm. That's not an exception. And your book, uh, Mark identifies good feelings as the primary metric of success in an anxious society. I think that's similar to what I'm talking about here with calling. But you write this, the choice to prioritize comfort, ease, and good feelings above growth is the choice to embrace and accept personal, spiritual, and emotional immaturity. Um, give us a bit of a hopeful vision. What's the prognosis or is there an example of somebody that you see who does this really well that presses through the hardship toward maturity for for the leader, him or herself, and then more broadly to the people that they've been called to care for. I think what I noticed being around lots of leaders in my life, and, and you get to meet people who you previously read about and so on, and I think there's a certain kind of leader which is able through the power of their personality to exhibit you know, energy and excitement, and, and you begin to realize that it's sort of a natural ability. <laughs> and, you know, through an environment, through how you act, through how you set that environment, you can create this hype moment. The world does that as well, you know. Sort of, you know, our Renaissance cathedrals are, you know, concerts and big sporting events where they're engaging our feelings. But then there's other people I've met, and I, I've just been so struck that sometimes I've met big leaders in cities and, and they have that, but in a sense it leaves you lacking because the world provides that like high energy, great personality. And there's been a couple of times, you know, actually I've gotten in the car with the person who's going to drive me to the airport or whatever. And you end up having this conversation with a very ordinary person who's not, <laughs> doesn't have this incredible, powerful person. But sometimes you encounter just like absolute gold in this very faithful person who walks with Jesus. I remember being at one talk where, um, you know, just being with this older guy after a service who was the last in the room and end up talking to him and, and he had quite a serious disability and he, he really struggled to talk. So I had to sit for a long time to talk to this guy. 
when I came away from those kinds of people, it's not a feelings thing. It's a connection with someone who Christ has transformed their life and they're actually Christ-like. And I realized that you don't get to Christ-likeness through keeping your feelings at this high momentum thing. That's not the kingdom of God. That's not the abundant life Jesus spoke about. But I think when you when you encounter people who have spiritual authority, so I have met leaders at times, and, and again, I really want to be careful. I don't want to name this, that person or that person. And you just go, there is something different. You can't put your finger on it from an earthly perspective. You go, there's something different where you are, you you have been so marked by Christ. You're living the gospel. You're, you're evidence of the kingdom to me. And you get there through making your life, following Christ's footsteps, the closest. You don't get there through managing your good feelings and the good feelings of those around you who lead. And so that sort of myth, that Western radical individualist, you know, Epicurean, hedonistic, whatever you want to call it, therapeutic, having good feelings all the time is the best human life. No, it's not. It's actually living as Christ. Yeah. So when we when we think it's feelings, we then go into leadership going, well, we've just got to keep everyone having good feelings, you know. But if you go into it going, no, I want to be, um, I'm being remade in Christ-likeness. That, that's the purpose of my life. I want to show people the different way of Jesus and live that. You're going to then create that in the leadership environment that you create for people to follow. You want them to follow Jesus. You don't want them to follow your feelings. Yeah. Oh, man. That's a good word. And one more question for Mark Sayers about a non-anxious presence, how a changing and complex world will create a remnant of renewed Christian leaders published by Moody. Uh, One of the things you you talk about in here, Mark, of course, as we've been hearing here, is this transition period and the acceleration of these changes and the key key to leadership of being able to adapt in an ever-changing environment. How do you do that, though, Mark, when you're also trying to stay, not just trying, but you're required to stay historically and theologically rooted as a Christian? So I actually believe that theological and historical rootedness gives you this brilliant foundation to be adaptive and creative. And, you know, I began to realize like when the pandemic hit and we couldn't do all the stuff that we usually did, I still could be a Christian. So there was was a moment and I talk about this in the book. I had a meeting uh, in... 2019 in about October with a ministry we've got a number of Persian people um, or in the area where we live and a lot of them who come from a Muslim background in Iran have become believers and we have some at our church and so we had a meeting with a ministry that um, basically provides resources for the Persian church in Iran and the Persian diaspora around the world and you know I was asking them you know how do you do this and they say well basically we record like worship in London and they have a sermon in Farsi and that's distributed by the internet. And that goes, you know, sort of sent into Iran and different places it goes on USBs or is downloaded from the internet in places like Afghanistan, but also like now with the Persian diaspora in places like Malaysia and Scandinavia. And I remember thinking, wow, so you can't, you know, because in the church in Iran, they can't gather often because of the government, they have to have this sort of online church. (laughs) I remember thinking at the time, oh, okay, you know, you know, I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'll see that's them, you know. When, when we got to the point where in 2020, we realized like, and we were in one of the world's longest lockdowns here in Melbourne, we could not meet. We barely met as a church in two years. You know, I never thought that would happen. I never had in my plan of, okay, if we were hitting at this point of growth, real growth, literally like the week, but, you know, we'd been sort of growing and, you know, looked sort of, you know, successful from, you know, a sort of earthly perspective of people coming and energy and excitement. And then once those things which I thought were just rusted on to what it was to do church, to meet, to be able to see my people, to have in-person meetings, to be able to even just meet with people, to even, you know, travel, like I, you know, travel to to speak about, you know, God and couldn't do that. I did not. I've left Melbourne once in two years. I couldn't go more than uh, three miles for a lot of the last two years because of our restrictions. I just never thought that would happen. And, and I remember just sitting uh, in a park down the end of the street here in the midst of all this going, God, how do I do this? And my mind went back to the Iranians. And now people listening might not realize that 
there is effectively a, a Persian revival at this point in time. More Persians have come to faith in the last uh, sort of 10 years than in centuries. And I just felt God saying, Mark, you can be, you know, like the mission is still the same. <laughs> you know, preach the gospel, you know, uh, live this kingdom life, um, build my church. Um, so we were then able to be creative and adaptive. And, and I'm so proud of my team. I, I see my team, which is primarily millennials, the last years has made them. I see really wonderful growing leaders um, who adapted. The way I saw them adapt to the different stri- restrictions that came into Melbourne. I mean, there's, there's one day when we did our Rebuilders podcast and uh, Liddy's the other, she's the, like, the co-host. And she was literally like, 50 meters from me in a sealed off room. Daniel's in the middle. Okay, people saw the vision. It was almost comical because we couldn't be in these, like we had to be in these separate rooms, but Daniel had like rigged up all of the, the cables and yeah, so proud of them. And so I think that actually when you've got that, it's like a kite. A kite can fly on the currents of the wind in all different directions. It can dive and do circles because it's holding to that string. So I actually think that that foundation enables you then, you know, if Sundays get taken away, you can still do, you can still preach the gospel, you know, like we've got all these, these things. So I think limitations are actually the father of creativity, but the foundation in Christ and the, 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 the church is actually what gives you your grounding. Yeah, man, I appreciate that. There's a great quote I wanted to make sure to share. I've shared many of them already. Uh, people have got a good, a good chunk of the book. I've, I've loved it so much. But you write this, As the cultural pressure increases against the church in our gray zone moment, and we find ourselves in a wilderness, those who turn to God, who choose not to run from the wilderness, who seek his presence in the wilderness, will be transformed with spiritual authority. It's a good hopeful note uh, to end on. My guest here has been Mark Sayers, author of A Non-Anxious Presence, How a Changing and Complex World Will Create a Remnant of Renewed Christian Leaders. It's new from Moody. Mark, it's been great to talk to you again. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks for listening to this episode of Gospel Bound. For more interviews and to sign up for my newsletter, head over to tgc.org slash gospelbound. Rate and review Gospel Bound on your favorite podcast platform so others can join the conversation. Until next time, remember, when we're bound to the gospel, we abound in hope. Thank you.